What's up my pre-calc people? In this video, I wanna take a look at a set of multiple choice questions that come out of units one and two that deal with general function types. All right, let's dive into them right now. Before we dive into the questions, I wanna remind you all of these questions were taken from the AP Pre-Calculus course and exam description. Now they say that 15 to 23% of all the multiple choice questions will be over general function analysis with non-analytical problems. All right, so let's take a look at these multiple choice right now. All right, here is the first one. The depth of water and feet at a certain place in a lake is modeled by a function w. The graph of w of t is shown for values of t ranging from 0 to 30, where t is the number of days since the first day of the month. What are the intervals of t of which the depth of the water is increasing at a decreasing rate? All right, so what we see here is that as the days go by of the month, we see that the water level changes. Sometimes it goes higher, sometimes it goes lower, sometimes it goes back up. And we're looking for where it's increasing at a decreasing rate. So the first is where it's increasing. So I notice it's increasing from 18 towards 30. I also notice it's increasing from 0 to 6. From 618, it is decreasing. So I don't want to choose any interval in there. Now, the next thing i got to figure out is where it's increasing at a decreasing rate. Now, decreasing rate means concave down. That means that our rate of change is decreasing. So this first interval right here from 0 to 3, we see that it's definitely increasing, but it's increasing at an increasing rate. It starts off kind of slower and then it speeds up. So that is not what we're looking for. We're looking for concave down. And if you look at that, it's also clearly concave up. Same thing with 18 to 30. We're increasing, and if we look at some rates of change, the rates of change are increasing. And we can also see in the graph that it's clearly concave up. So we're looking for concave down, which is going to happen right here from 3 to 6. From 3 to 6, right here, we're still increasing, but we notice that the rate of change is getting lower. It's getting less and less it's positive. It's getting less steep. It's still positive because it's increasing, but it's lessening. And you can clearly see from the graph that it's concave down. So again, if I erase that all right there, we definitely see that in that section, we're concave down and we're increasing. So the answer is A, 3 to 6 only. All right, and this next question says the polynomial function P is an odd function. And they tell us that P of 3 equals negative 4 is a relative max. And they say, which of the following is true about P of negative 3? All right, so a couple of things i got to remember about what an odd function means. An odd function means that if I plug a negative value into a function, I get the opposite of if I plug the positive value into a function. So this means that if P of 3 equals negative 4, then when I plug in the opposite of 3, which is negative 3, I need to get the opposite result. So I'd be positive 4. So again, even function, which I know this question isn't mentioned, but even function, if you plug in a positive value for x or the negative value of that same x, you get the exact same answer. That is the opposite of what for an odd function, right? So we plug in 3, we get negative 4. We know that's true. So we automatically know without having to even look at a graph or anything that if we plug in negative 3, we get positive 4. So that immediately makes B and D wrong. Now we got to figure out if it's a max or a min. And that's where we got to remember another fact about odd functions. An odd function can be reflected across the x-axis and then the y-axis, or in the other order, order doesn't matter, but it's reflected across the x and y-axis, and it gets the exact same graph. So to determine if this is going to be a min or a max, let me just make a quick little graph here to try to process this. All right, so let's just graph the first point. 1, 2, 3 over, 1, 2, 3, 4 down. So this is just a terrible graph, but you get the idea. And they tell us that this is a relative max. So it's going to look something like that. Terrible drawing, but it's a relative max. So if I were to reflect that across the x-axis, it's going to come up here somewhere. And then across the y-axis, it's going to come over here. And that would make sense because that would be the second point I knew that at negative 3, 1, 2, negative 3, and then positive 1, 2, 3, 4, there is that other point. So that would have to be a relative minimum. So the answer here is C. Once again, because if I'm thinking about first, I knew that P of negative 3 equals 4 for sure. And then if I take that original point that they gave me, which they said was a max, and I reflect it across the X and Y axis, that would turn into a relative minimum. All right. Next question here. The table gives functions or values of a function g for selected values of x. The function f is given by f of x equals 3 raised to the x plus x squared. 
what is the value of f g of three? So this is a composition function. There's definitely going to be several of these on the test. So hopefully you're really good at finding composition functions. So we always start on the inside. What is g of three? So I'm going to go to my table over here that shows values of g. And if I plug three into g, I get negative two. So g of three is negative two. Easy. Now I simply have to take that negative two, the output of g of three, and plug it into f. So I get three raised to the negative two plus negative two squared, literally plugging negative two into function f. Three raised to negative two is one ninth. Hope you guys understand that. Negative exponent moves me to the denominator where I can become a three squared, which is nine, plus negative two squared is four. Now, you're not allowed to use the calc on this problem, so if that's not a big deal with you guys, all you gotta do is get a common denominator. I'm gonna look at four as 36 ninths. Hopefully you guys know that, that's pretty easy. So one ninth plus 36 ninths is clearly 37 ninths, so there's my answer right there. Pretty easy working with compositions. All right, this next problem is a really good one, and you're definitely gonna see something like this pop up on the test in some shape or form as well. All right, so they're talking about a litter regression. They say a food vendor developed a new sandwich type for sale. The vendor made estimates about the sales of the new sandwich uh, type over time. A linear regression was used to develop a model for the sales over time. Okay, so they created a linear regression model. Awesome. The figure shows a graph of the residuals of the linear regression, which the following statements is true about the linear regression. Okay, now what we do here is we're looking at this picture down here. And this is a residual plot. It's a plot of our residuals. And if you learn one thing, you should know that a plot of your residuals should look totally mixed up, no pattern whatsoever. That's a sign that your linear model was appropriate. Again, a, I'll say it one more time. A residual plot that shows just scatter, no pattern whatsoever, is a sign that your linear model is appropriate. So if I'm looking at this residual plot and I clearly see a pattern, like it's obvious there is a pattern here, like it's not scattered whatsoever, that is a sign that my linear model is not appropriate. So I can immediately get rid of C and D because they said the linear model is appropriate. What would be a good residual plot for a, an appropriate linear model? Something like this, with literally points scattered all over the place, no pattern whatsoever. That is basically saying that your regression line is going through your data, and if you're going through your data, you're going to have positive and negative residuals mixed throughout. So we're obviously not going through our data very well when we see a pattern in the residual plot. Now we got to pick the reason why. The first one says because there's a clear pattern in the graph of the residuals. Yes, that's literally what I just got done saying is when you see that clear pattern in the graph of the residuals, that's a sign your linear model is not appropriate. So there you go. The correct answer is A. All right, and in this final problem, it's a transformation problem, which I love. Transformations are, are really simple if you just know the rules. All right, so they give us data. They give us a table for f, function f. They give us some inputs and they give us some outputs. Then they tell us that this new function g has some transformations done to it. So b is a uh, horizontal dilation, a is a vertical dilation, and c is a vertical translation. And then they actually give us what those values are. So let's actually write g of x using what they say. So first they said there's a horizontal dilation by a factor of two. That means my b value inside is a one half. You got to remember horizontal translations and horizontal dilations kind of lie to you, right? So if it's a factor of two, then the B value needs to be one half. If it was a factor of a half, then the B value would be two. So again, you got to be really careful with that one. They're kind of a little tricky. So hopefully you learned that well. Then there's a vertical dilation by a factor of three. Vertical dilations are out in front and they're always true to what they say. If it's by a factor of three, you put a three out in front. If it's a factor of one third, you put a one third out in front. It doesn't lie to you. Then we have a vertical translation by five units. So it's a positive five. So that means our D value on the outside, or I'm sorry, the C value in this case is going to be a positive five. All right, so now we just actually have to utilize what we just learned because now they want us to figure out what is g of negative four. So now that I was able to write my function with those transformations, all I got to do is plug in a negative four. So I get three times f of one half times negative four plus five. And then I start on the inside, one half times negative four is negative two. So I have three f of negative two plus five. Now I got to use my table to figure out what is f of negative two. And that's right here. f of negative two is five. So I have three times five plus five and three times five is 15. 15 plus five is 20. So there's my final answer there, D. All right, so this was just a quick video over a couple quick examples that kind of deal with some general function analysis. Um, obviously, you're going to see different types of problems for sure, but I, I think these questions actually cover a lot of the things that you're guaranteed to see. You're going to talk about residual plots. You're going to talk about transformations. You're going to talk about compositions of functions and concavity. 
concave up, concave down, and what that means for graph is definitely going to come up. So I think analyzing these questions is really good to look at and practice, but hopefully you get a lot of more practice questions in the ultimate review packet that I have for you. That way you could continue to practice all of these skills.